for the, anyone who can't. Okay, so I'm going to um, hand over to James. First of all, welcome, James, and thank you very much for uh, joining us and doing your, your community call with us today. It's very much appreciated. I will hand over to you, ask you to just introduce yourself more fully, and then feel free to, to lead yourself into, into the discussion and the topics that you're going to bring and share with us today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Lauren. And, hmm, and I appreciated that uh, minute of meditation there as well. Uh, I found myself reminding myself of a little trick. Uh, there is space behind my head. Just bringing my awareness to that space, a little bit of an outside view um, versus being in it uh, and inside of it, which is uh, part of the topic today. How to handle anything, kind of a cheeky uh, bit of a title there, but um, <clears throat> regardless, I am I'm glad to see uh, those of you who I know and even those of you who I don't know here, uh, I'm imagining and feeling a kinship in interest in growing, in handling problems, in being the people that we want to be. And being able to ride the waves and uh, surf in any situation that we might find ourselves in. So it's the inner game, uh, as well as the ability to help make the world a better place and be of service to the world. So yeah, that's the kinship I'm feeling here. And I do appreciate seeing all your faces. Thank you. It's great to connect and stay in connection. Um, as I try to bring you an offering of learning and experience from Intentional Society, which is the name of an online community that I founded about three years ago now. I would call it a developmental relational online community. Uh, would be one short way to characterize it. And in it, weekly and at other cadences, we've been experimenting and practicing in many different ways. And so out of that, I'm bringing with me today three words, and they are awareness, acceptance, and integrity. I'm not going to hold them back as some surprise reveal or anything. I'm going to repeat those words a lot. Awareness, acceptance, and integrity. So just three words plus a bunch more words trying to describe those three words and get across what they're pointing at. Because uh, it's tough. It's hard. It's taken a long time to uh, to get to this point and be able to bring this out as a message. So this is, in some sense, the world premiere uh, of this here today. So glad to be with you here. This feels like a big deal in that sense for me. Um, trying to point at the things behind these words and see how transmissible they are and how well they connect with your life and your experience here. Uh, first, I want to point at a little bit of a background frame where from where I'm coming from, and that's uh, the adult development frame. Um, this is not going to be a big deal in the talk today, but just kind of as background, there are Oh, there are all these developmental theorists, uh, such as Keegan, Cookreuter, Torbert. Uh, if you've heard of any of those names, great. If you haven't, who cares? Um, but kind of in the ego development, maybe even the Piagetian line of developmental theorists that for you know, 30, 50, and beyond you know, years, they've been exploring, trying to research, describe, figure out. You know, how do we grow? How do we keep growing into adulthood and beyond, even as adults? Um, but I'm not going to talk about their their stage models today. They've got all these different models and stages and names and classifications. And, and that's not important. But underneath all those models, there's something that these folks call the subject-object shift, which is another terrible name uh, because that name itself like switches reference in the middle. Um, the first part is you are subject to something. And then the second part is the thing, there's the switch, becomes like an object to you. So confusing name, but 
the important thing is we we know that humans do this. We we all do this in our own lives and we can see this, we can point to the shifts, we can describe the growth, but how do we grow? How do we make those inscrutable moves inside of ourselves to expand ourselves and our perspective and our capacity? Um, in the over in the academic field, most of what I can pick up about how far that's gotten is that people agree that we mostly do it unconsciously and slowly, uh, maybe painfully, oftentimes with a lot of flailing uh, around as we do it because we don't really know what or how we're we're doing it. Um, so that just felt like a gap uh, as I looked into into that field. And intentional society has been a research field, a practice field for exploring this. And so I'm I'm really excited to have stumbled on really these these words and these pointers uh, and this model, the evolution of it, and have a way to explain and point at the how to for how we grow. So that's that's really what I'm excited about bringing out is this like how to guide uh, from our experience. Uh, two more brief things before I unpack this hopefully no longer secret pattern of uh, psychological development. But the first thing is, I just want to disclaim, I didn't invent this from nothing uh, or, you know, de novo, just from my own genius or whatever. It's it's not that. There are many, many giant shoulders that we're standing on here. I referred to the adult development academics. Many of them can talk about these moves pretty well. Uh, many, many coaches can talk about how they've seen people grow in their coaching practices. Psychologists have written many, many books uh, across this whole general area. There's lots out there already. So uh, our contribution today, I hope, is in concision and applicability and transmission uh, around using these words. And at Intentional Society, these words actually started as values. We were listing out our core values of what seemed to be at the core, the essence of what we really valued. And these floated up to the top. And, and then we realized that we'd actually sort of connected and synthesized this pithy how-to mantra for conscious growth. The model also rhymes with a bunch of other stuff out there that's you know existing in the world. Multiple people have pointed me to the RAIN model by Tara Brock uh, as like being pretty darn close to the same thing. Also the principles of uh, ACT in therapy, the acceptance and commitment therapy model and principles point pretty much at the same thing. There are other things that I know about, probably even more that I don't know about, but um, this is floating around here, feels at the edge of maybe what we're all trying to name and solidify and understand. Um, with these words and with these pointers, the second thing I wanna disclaim is that words are just pointers. They're just words. Uh, these words are ours from our own lived experience, and they resonate with us, but they're not perfect. They're not precise. No words are. And the thing that they're pointing at is these kind of hard to describe mental motions uh, that we can make. And it's those moves, those motions, those are the things that are the glorious moon up in the sky. And these words are fingers pointing to them. Uh, to grab the Bruce Lee uh, movie quote that says, don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. Keep in mind, the words are the pointers uh, where you know, it's really pointing to this, um, these mental motions. And I'm really interested, the people that are here with me today here to see how this connects with you and how this resonates. And after I, you know, uh, blab at you for 20 something minutes here, uh, I'm really interested in hearing like, how does this connect? What words have you used? Uh, how have you experienced this in your life? So three words, uh, and actually each of them has a, a supporting verb as well, but uh, three states, three motions. These are our mantra for how to grow. Awareness, acceptance, integrity. Uh, how to grow to handle the toughest kind of problems, the kind of problems that require us to be 
more spacious, to become, uh, have a greater capacity in order to solve the kind of stuckness or wrongness or stresses that seem intractable or impossible from a certain frame, but we end up usually seeking thus to, to grow and expand our worldview, our conception, our perspectives, usually because nothing else works in those kinds of situations. So they can be big, giant seeming problems or challenges in your life. They can also be small or at least mundane seeming problems, like how your housemate does the dishes or, or how they don't do the dishes, as the, the case may be. Even something like that, we may need to, to grow, to shift ourselves, our perspectives, in order to see a way to, um, when we can do this, we, we don't just solve our problems, but I like to say we dissolve our problems by expanding and finding a new perspective. The, the way in which there was a conflict or a problem, it can, can just dissolve. All right, enough preamble. Uh, let's try to point at these three things. The first is awareness, awareness. Uh, and the complementary verb form is noticing in the sense of we reach a state of awareness by doing noticing, kind of the relationship there. And okay, here's James saying that awareness is important. Yeah, big deal. What's, what's new there, right? Uh, hopefully that's maybe pretty solid ground. Uh, we're aware that awareness is important. We've had contemplative religious traditions for thousands of years telling us this. And so this is right in line with all of that in one sense. But the thing that I'm trying to point to about the, the kind of awareness that uh, this mental motion uh, is around is, I'm gonna say it first as realizing that a thing is a thing or realizing that one thing is actually two things can be pulled apart. And that's like, what? That's so abstract, right? Um, and so what is the nature of this? What Of realizing the thingness of something? What are you on about? Um, going back to this subject-object shift kind of definition, the, the phrase being subject to something there points at... Um, how there can be a stuck insideness of something, being inside a thing, and the way that we relate to a thing. Um, by thing, I kind of point at like problem or challenging circumstance or whatever, whatever the issue is here. But looking at the thing and sort of thinking that, um, oh, that thing is external. It's part of the reality around me. Uh, it is fixed. It's unchangeable. It's immutable. It's just... Uh, it's just the way that things are. That's a sense of you know, kind of being inside the thing or not seeing the movability of the thing. Uh, if you find yourself using words like need, must, have to, bad, wrong, can't, you know, that whole cluster, uh, those words point at uh, being uh, kind of trapped inside. Uh, or subject to something. Um, a sentence, if you say, you know, somebody says, this person needs to change their behavior because I can't stand it. I just can't stand it anymore. Like very, you know, demonstrative example of like, if you see, you, you can hear already that person, like how that person is stuck inside of a, it's this person, they need to change. I can't, I can't stand it. It just won't do, uh, you know, how, how that frame can be a cage. And how do we get ourselves out of being stuck inside of something? Well, uh, a word I like to use is parallax. Uh, that's the, the word for like when um, the displacement of an object is caused by you changing your uh, po observer's point of view. You know, you can tell that a street lamp is closer to you than the stars because when you walk, the street lamp moves, the stars don't. You know, it's by your movement that you see, oh, wait, that thing moved. Uh, and maybe it's not embedded in the firmament of the very heavens themselves. Maybe that's a thing that's a little closer to me. Or maybe I can move and take a little bit different perspective. So um, 
we can ask ourselves, we can prompt ourselves, we can ask, oh, this thing, what, you know, that I'm afraid of, or that I think is, is true. What if it's, what if it's not true? Um, or we can, we can ask the people, we can ask others that are, that are involved in it. Uh, we can ask third parties, friends, observers. Uh, most growth comes from uh, kind of seeing something inside of us or seeing how something that we thought was external is actually inside of us and is part of the perspective that we're taking. So getting separation from a uh, false equality uh, and the, the psychological term for this is cognitive diffusion is another way to say the thing that I'm trying to point at here. Uh, so learning, gaining the aha, maybe awareness that whatever we're looking at, this environmental condition outside of us, uh, oh, it's it's not fused to how we have to feel about it. Or this prompt is not fused to the behavior that we take in reaction or in response to it. Awareness, so that's what I mean by awareness unlocks the thingness of seeing that things are things and that they could move uh, or flex or change and that our perspective can change how we're seeing things. So then the next choice that that brings us to then is what do we do with the thing that we've noticed or that we've seen? And I want to point to some practices too for each of these three words for awareness um, there are many, many practices. Uh, meditation, obviously, is uh, typically an awareness practice. Coaching is an awareness practice. Good coaches ask us questions that unlock different ways of seeing things that we're feeling stuck with. Um, journaling, uh, internal family systems. There's a practice called focusing, social noting, troika consulting from liberating structures, empathy circling, just plain asking a friend how they see a situation. All of these things, many others, uh, can assist us in awareness and practicing awareness. So on to acceptance now. And my supporting verb is welcoming. We, we gain acceptance by doing the move of welcoming something. Uh, so what what to do with the thing that we've just noticed? Um, I'm going to, first of all, say that the first thing to do, the really maybe the key point here is we want to do nothing. And there's more things that we want to do after the nothing. But first, the task is to do nothing. Uh, just accepting the presence and the reality of that thing, of that of that problem, of the things that are happening, of the hopefully the data, the facts of what are happening, but um, the whole situation often for us feels bad or aversive. And so our default reactions are usually to at least flinch away from it a little bit. Uh, maybe we try some denial uh, or maybe we just kind of turn away, look away, run away from it. Uh, or maybe we just like tense ourselves up uh, you know, against the situation and we armor up and def put our defenses up. and. But the tension of defending and resisting the thing, that's the trap. Uh, it's like those little tubular finger trap kind of things. You know, that once you're in them, the, the harder you pull against it, the tighter it grips you. And con conversely, and a little counterintuitively, it's moving in and toward the thing and relaxing toward the thing that... Um, accepting and welcoming the thing and the just the state of the world as it already is, that's the thing that frees us. Uh, I have a few sentences from Eugene Gendlin, the creator of Focusing, that I'd like to share here uh, in a moment. All right. He wrote, what is true is already so. Owning up to it doesn't make it worse. Not being open about it doesn't make it go away. And because it's true, it is what is there to be interacted with. So this is the art of letting reality be true. That's the essence of acceptance. 
what I'm using that word to point at. <clears throat> if you can picture yourself in relationship to your problem, inviting your problem to sit next to you uh, in a chair next to you, uh, just be sitting there and you can imagine it there without uh, pushing it away or turning away from it uh, or attacking it or anything like that, just letting it sit there. Uh, if you can imagine that, that's a good picture of no longer feeling or being subject to the problem, no longer being inside of it, but rather, oh, it's an object, it's movable, it's in space, it's there next to you. <clears throat> and even further, uh, you can take the, the problem and, and as if it were an object, hold it in your hands. Uh, and in that space, in that mode, you can you can you can rotate it and twist it and look at it from different ways and different angles and that's the objectness that that subject object shift refers to um, there's one more quote uh this one is attributed to ramdas uh one sentence that uh the world is perfect as it is including my desire to change it and it's this it, this was a very challenging quote when I first heard it. The world is perfect as it is, including my desire to change it. But what, what, what? Yeah, but, um, and we can quibble actually about the connotations of the word perfect um, because the kind of acceptance that I am talking about here is not approval. Acceptance is not approval. It's not uh, put on the rose-colored glasses and go into spiritual bypassing mode and just say, oh, I love, I love everything. I approve of everything as it is. It's, it's not that. This is just about accepting that what is, that it is, uh, and that it's there. And so we can't change anything about what is true in the present moment. And so might as well not fight against what is there and is true in this moment. So we can uh, so we can accept these things that we might even feel that like, oh, they're bad. They're bad things. But we can accept that they're there and that they're true simultaneously with our own feelings, even our own judgments about that thing or toward those things. And both of those things can coexist. There's no conflict. They're both there being real in the present moment. And our desires that we wish those things were different, if we can let go of those in the moment, we can still hold on to it for the future. We can still have desires. We can still have wishes for how we want the future world state to be, but that's in the future. And as each moment of the future passes into the present moment, it's here. It is what it is, and we can practice accepting what is in the present moment. So being okay with the facts of what is, that is what frees us up, gives us that space, that flexibility to then choose how do we want to be and how do we want to relate to that thing. Uh, acceptance practices that I'll name of uh, number one on my list is a practice called circling. Uh, and I could talk for a lot about circling, but I just, I won't at the moment. Um, but just, I really have relished that practice as a really good uh, acceptance building practice. There's a related practice called T group. Uh, there's also coherence therapy and ACT acceptance and commitment therapy, a couple of therapeutic modalities that really go after this acceptance frame. Uh, and I, I love them for, for that. But um, so those are some acceptance practices. Uh, and then we move on to our third word. We've done awareness, acceptance, and on to integrity. Uh, the verb form here is kind of tricky. Uh, we get integrity by doing what? I'm going to go with holding intent with us and staying connected to. Uh, or maybe I'll say staying grounded in the stance, grounded and connected with being the way that we want to be. Acceptance and that space of acceptance is what lets us choose our intention towards how we want to be and how we want to hold ourselves in relationship 
uh, to the situation or the facts of the, whatever the problem or the challenge is. But it's not just making a choice. Even the language of make a choice sounds a little fictional to me uh, because it's like pretending, oh, we just just choose something, right? And then you know you and then you've made the choice done, right? Well, no, we we don't just like make up our minds and then suddenly everything about us and in us and our behaviors like change to be in line with that choice that we just made. Uh, instead, it takes embodying and practicing and grooving that new way of being into us, into our patterns, into our behaviors, into our soul, if you like that word. Occasionally, unlocking some new bit of awareness can feel like enough uh, if it, for example, just like releases us, sort of snaps us free from some assumption that we were holding. But more often than not, we've got some rewiring to do of our nervous system, of our patterns, of our habits, uh, to integrate our intended stance throughout our whole mind-body system. So practice, practice, practice is the name of the game for integrity. And acceptance is still our friend in that process. Uh, we're, you know, we're not going to get it perfect the first time or every time. Uh, and bringing loving compassion towards ourselves as we do it and just acceptance the thing I'd love to say to, you know, maybe a few folks here who might need to hear this is be aware you have always done the best that you possibly could. And if you feel a flinch of like, oh, no, I've, I've screwed up and I've made mistakes and I could have done so much better. Well, let's look back at it. It is what happened if you were to do something different in that situation, something something would have been different. Something in you or something outside of you, but something would have been different. And what happened happened because it was the in a way, only thing that could have happened. So we're always doing our best in that sense. And I hope that's comforting. It was to me uh, when I took it inside myself of like, oh, even when I failed, even when I've made mistakes, I was always doing the best that I could. And maybe there were things that, that I wasn't aware of, um, or even the thing, you know, aware of about the things that I was aware of. And there were, you know, I wish I could have been different, but um, knowing that I'm always trying my best, you can bring that uh, kind of love and care to yourself as you practice integrity. And as you try to um, integrate something into your system or uh, find integrity with something outside of your system, the way that you relate to it. it just um, anyways, uh, I think it's a very important substep here to be able to release the blame and the shame and the badness and the judgment that we sometimes heap upon ourselves uh, in order to let ourselves be in that space of, yeah, we're building. I'm building integrity in this new way of being. So it's not just the quantity of practice too, but the quality and the context relevance of our practice uh, that brings lasting you know, change. Uh, integrity practices, I'll just point at living and, and being and practicing the thing and or practicing in intentional spaces. So you can do this by going and doing a co-living residency in Bergerac. And that's a wonderful place to practice being who you want to be. Uh, and you can also do this in community of other flavors. You can also do this in practice spaces, intentional practice spaces, where people are, maybe they're simulating or role-playing or just trying to inhabit and make contact with similar context, contexts uh, to the place where you really want to apply this. You know, it's all well and good to like practice it in this a uh, little narrow zone here, but then you got to be able to bring it back out into your whole life and flush it through the the real situations. So, uh, so there we go. Those are the three words: acceptance, uh, or awareness, acceptance, and integrity. One, two, three. Uh, but it's not. Uh, I don't mean to imply that it is a clean three-stage, three-step process. You don't finish number one, then 
go on to number two. And then, then finally, number three, life is messy. You're going to bounce around uh, in all three of these. Uh, and sometimes, you know, different ones will feel more important. They're, they're big, they're vast. There are whole practices inside of or that focus on each of these mental moves, these mental motions. And also sometimes it can seem like we maybe can do all three moves almost simultaneously. Uh, it's just life is messy. The map is is too clean. Uh, it's not precise. It, you know that's not the way that the real territory of life is. But these three words, kind of as a mantra and a reminder to ourselves, uh, this is our how to uh, from intentional society, how to grow. Uh, that I think applies across all of our psychological growth throughout our whole lives. Um, and there are, you know, big shifts in most of our lives uh, from childish self-centered mindset into social awareness and fitting in socially. Uh, and then from, from socially defined reality to authoring and asserting our own unique identity and personal values as an individual. Uh, and then even then, as an adult, from adult independence into like post-conventional worldviews uh, that highlight interdependence and polarities and paradox. Um, growth applies, you know, to managing complex teams at work. It applies to how to make space for differences between housemates. Uh, we're always growing to in in a very real sense, become bigger than our problems that we were once stuck inside of. So we keep growing and we can support our own growth by leaning into that edge, those edges and those challenges, and by supporting ourselves, by surrounding ourselves with people and practices and culture that are aware of growth and of these moves and hold growth itself as an object. As we grow, we find oh, freedom and ease and peace, stability, uh, deep okayness that really can handle anything that life can throw at us. Uh, and I don't mean every situation, every moment of life, if you're in a a physical fist fight or something, or in a you know fight or flight kind of this is not what I'm meaning and pointing at. Handle that kind of problem, but um, but it's those big problems that once again that require us to level up or to expand or to to shift and grow our mindset to transform in order to uh, be with and or dissolve the problems and the challenges that we are facing. So, yeah, I wish you all of the best in, you know, finding and doing and connecting with these mental motions or maybe whatever equivalents or analogs make sense to you in your life. Uh, conscious co-living, such as with life itself, would be a great training ground for those growth muscles. Intentional society, uh, where we evolved this model, uh, is still there. And we're a, a free online community of practice that is deliberately developmental uh, in this way. And when I when I talk with people who are are interested in both intentional society and in physical, um, you know, community and uh, intentional community land based, uh, I sometimes say something like, uh, "Intentional society, if we can help people be the kind of people that would be great leaders of an intentional community." then uh, then we've accomplished something very valuable and, and, and near the core of what intentional society is about. Um, and lastly, if you would like to practice this in a workplace context specifically, uh, the Relational Agility course uh, starting January 2024, uh, that is built uh, with a, a collaborator and myself built on this same model and on this same framework. So. That is all I have to say about accept, uh, awareness, acceptance, and integrity, and how to practice them, and where to practice them. And so I'm done. I'm looking forward to listening now for a bit and turning the call back over to, to Lauren and to all of you. And I, I'd really love to hear, how do you all connect with this? 
Do you have different words? Do you have different experiences that maybe actually are the same thing or feel like a similar thing? I'd uh, love to hear how you relate to these things uh, and or any questions or things that are just sparking at you that we'd want to discuss. So thanks, Lauren. Amazing. Thank you so much, James. So yeah, I'm just going to hand over to everyone else on this call. Feel free to unmute yourself or drop a question in the chat and I can read it out um, to James if if needed. But yeah, does anybody have any comments or any questions that they'd like to start with? Matthew, feel free to go for it. Yeah, um, lots to say. I'm trying to figure out like what's the best angle to take here. Um, we kind of just had a pro or in the middle of a project actually that is centered on development and developmental spaces. I notice he used the word deliver deliberately developmental spaces at the end there. Um, so it's been on my mind a lot recently, kind of what development means and what are the what the practices are. Um, and I think one of the things that I like about your talk and one of the things that I saw in some of the organizations and some of the practices is this idea of um, like sometimes development is viewed as this linear trajectory of like improving yourself. And I think this idea that you're kind of already complete or everything is already within you, but figuring out the right methods and the right tools and the right practices of kind of this with this one program it's called aletheia they they use the term self contact which i i, I think kind of makes sense um but figuring out how to enable that self contact i think is is really kind of in a lot of developmental conversations i think that should kind of be the center in a lot of different ways or it it should be more of a focus so i, I like like your framing um and i also just want to say that what you said about um mental motions is like uh that's what it is for me to or that resonates a lot because sometimes with concepts it's like at least for me I could never think my way into improving myself like that's that's it I've tried it and it's impossible <laughs> like um it's always for me it's like it's some bodily function or some I guess yeah kind of like practice or bodily um or kind of awareness too it, not necessarily like a physical bodily thing but kind of like a a way of being um that's a phrase we use a lot um or that pops around a lot um so it's for me it's it it is it kind of can be any sort of concept it's really kind of the thing that you're actually doing for me i think that's, that's important so those are just some general comments from my end yeah resonating with that and and it brings to mind you know the this i can't think myself uh into you know, like growing or solving or transforming. And, you know, yeah, we can, I think we can, we can no more force ourselves to grow psychologically than we can force ourselves to grow taller physically just by thinking about it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. But there is a way, yeah, in which uh, the environment is pulling on us, tugging on us. And if we can somehow dance with that, in a self-aware, then there's something about the dance that can smooth and flow this and uh, let it uh, happen. So, yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Isabella, I'm gonna invite you to unmute in just one minute. Um, Martin's left a comment in the chat, so I'm just gonna read it out for you, James, and then to um, get your reflections. So he mentions, is integrity to do with not feeling guilty about not being emotional judging or reacting when one feels one should or when one is compelled to. Is that, is it, Martin, do you, if you want to add anything, you're welcome to um, unmute and jump in as well. I mean, that's it pretty much. So thanks for reading this for me. You're very welcome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely affirm, uh, you know, being able to not feel guilty uh, about whatever emotions that you do or don't have. Um, I'd put a lot of this maybe in the acceptance kind of bucket, uh, if we're trying to bucket things in these three words, which again, is not the essence of the thing, which, which word bucket do they fall into? But, um, but yeah, of, of being able to accept all of our emotions as wisdom, as signal, as data, um, one of the uh, common key growth trajectories I see is being able to relate to our emotions in that way and not feel you know, that feeling a bad feeling 
uh, means that something is existentially wrong, but that there can be an okayness outside like, oh, I feel this feeling and I'm still okay. And what signal is this feeling bringing me? What valuable thing is this emotion protecting or guarding or you know what wisdom is it bringing to me? So uh, absolutely. And then staying in touch with that, uh, being in integrity with that kind of awareness, uh, Martin, yeah, absolutely is it's also a practice of integrity and integrating and being able to hold on to that kind of spaciousness. Uh, to receive your own emotions or your own judgments or reactions and thus be able to, yeah, move with them, learn from them and not get just, again, not get like trapped or stuck uh, inside of them, uh, but be able to, yeah, almost imagine yourself like juggling them. They're objects and you can juggle them, toss them around, play with them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, James. Isabella, do you want to jump in now? Sure. Um, so thank you, first of all, James. I really appreciated your um, laying out these principles and um, and offering also so much time that we could discuss them as well, which I find always so lovely and generous of a speaker. So um, I'm a developmental psychologist by um very conventional training and yet i left um academia a few years ago and in part it was because the deeply um uh, worked out uh developmental theories that i most jived with which were some piagetian but but also um jungian and um other more controversial <laughs> folks um, part of what they contribute and is incredibly out of vogue right now is um, a focus entirely outside of the self. And although I see a lot of resonance with much of the practices that I think part of the implications or uh, potential like uh, out outcomes for a lack of a less mechanistic word right now um, could be the feeling of connection with our fellow uh, organisms, uh, not just humans. I wondered, I wanted to ask you how much you all focus on three things. Um, one is just communal or collective practice that is not at all focused on the self. It is only about the social, and, and you named some of those practices, so I know there must be something there. Second is how much service comes into your context because we know from very conventional or psychological research as well as um, old wisdom traditions that a movement or across a developmental lifespan eventually often leads to a focus on service and a actual almost the flipping of many of the processes when we think about acceptance of the self and awareness those are all really good and i don't want to put them away at all but i think that there is that's a platform from which we often move and given the middle agedness of myself that's where i'm coming from and then the third is the degree to which these um two things are connected to land and I don't mean that in a trivial way of like, do you give, you know, acknowledgements? I know you're from Canada like I am and we do, but the extent to which uh, those communal practices and those self-development practices are connected to the earth larger system that we are a part of and how explicit that might be. Wow, that is, that is a lot there. And I feel like I could give a few more 30-minute uh, uh, talks on some of those things. But very briefly, from our own experience and what we've got going on in intentional society, and this hits some of our edges here, too, is that uh, absolutely, yes, the, the social collective uh, practices, um, it might be fairly rare that there's no individual or introspective element to what is also a collective communal practice. Uh, but it absolutely is 
within intentional society, we attempt to, at least, to hold the collective as object as well amongst us and between us uh, and kind of talk about the 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 relational field, the culture, the what is the 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 thing between us, and uh, explicitly exploring that, thickening that, uh, you know, engaging with what are the qualities of the the collective culture that we are cultivating here ourselves. Like that's that's definitely a big thing uh, that um, yeah didn't doesn't really show up in those three words, but is absolutely part of a really important loop between individual and collective. Similarly, there's also a very important loop between the the being and the doing. And those are another polarity and cycle that both of them feed into each other. And within intentional society in our first three years here, two and a half years, uh, the focus really has been very much on the being side. Um, perhaps in part because I think default we start so, so much of the con conventional world is all about the doing and the achievement and the accomplishment and we neglect kind of the inner game and the being and so this has been the focus for us and we're at this edge right now uh, within intentional society where we're kind of trying to rebalance that particular like being and doing loop to like okay in service where does that show up how does that show up and do we, we don't, we haven't figured out yet. Are we, are we doing things together? Are we supporting each other in individual things? Are we starting new projects? Are we, you know, how does that show up? Uh, and I think the answer, I mean, is inevitably like all of the above uh, in terms of lots of different forms and ways and sizes uh, and ways of being in service. But um, so that's an edge uh, of our current exploration in IS. Uh, and then maybe even beyond our current edge that we haven't even gotten to yet is this question of land uh, and what does it mean? And perhaps in, and since we are a virtual community, we're in Zoom calls with each other, we're doing this online, uh, perhaps that's even harder uh, for us versus like, oh man, if I could just um, go plop down in Bergerac for three months uh, and just get really in touch with the people and the food and the house and the land around, like uh, just, you know, very different kinds of experiences. So we've both found that it's remarkable what you can do online and how you can connect with people and how you can interface and how you can grow. Uh, and there's something that like, well, we just don't know how to, uh, at least with intentional society, integrate this uh, this land question, this land piece so far. But um, it's kind of, you know, in my dreams uh, down the road. So thanks for all that. And yeah, trying to hit those three things. Thanks, James. Thank you. Rufus, you have your hand up. Do you want to jump in now? Sure. Um, first, we'll just really thank you uh for both the presentation and also for the the people's comments i guess the brothers is great and other people have been great so really rich um you know maybe actually just to comment on the last point i think there's a there's a valerie a, a colleague of jokes you know the danger of personal de personal development is a trap for, for obvious <laughs> for obvious reasons i mean i mean many people get that but it's like yeah you kind of you can you can just yourself can just get stronger and stronger um whereas obviously you hope to at some point transcend that a bit i guess i guess my question a bit to you james is what so to one of the things i guess i notice in this area is um this kind of story of you know I, I don't know if anyone's known anyone or even themselves, like there's a point in your life where you wanted to lose weight or you know someone wants to lose weight. And, you know, what do you do to lose weight in general? You know, if you are, are you know, well, you kind of eat either eat differently or less or you exercise more. And the funny thing is, I've met no one that I've known who is having this challenge when I've told them this information has been like, my God, Rufus, just thank you so much. I never realized that's what it was. You know, I never got that I just had to eat less of that chocolate cake, whatever it was. It was just a mystery to me. That it, it makes no difference. Um, 
And so there's something kind of in people's way in like acting, you know, with the with the information they have or, you know, how to quit smoking, just stop smoking. <laughs> um, and so the fascinating question that I suppose I, I'm often having is what predicts or what do you see contributes to people actually doing the practices, if you like, right? Because it's kind of like we know what to do or it's like, you know, you should meditate every day. And maybe you do that more than you watch the Netflix or whatever it is for who, whatever it is for you, but you don't do it. Um, and so I kind of am fascinated, like what do you see in like people's kind of persistence in doing the practice in your group? I mean, the very fact you've kind of, you mentioned you've kind of got community, you have like Sangha, that seems really important. So I guess it's this, this is one of the things I'm really interested in is that like, maybe we kind of know often that the, the practices, but what is, what do you find really helps people in kind of con continuing to practice them, which is what turns them from the kind of, oh yeah, yeah, I can see what it would mean to like be less identified with my thoughts to like, oh yeah, I'm actually less give, I really am less given day to day by my my negative thoughts about myself or others, or you know, I'm able to accept things that difficult things that arise in my in my life in a more powerful and, and constructive way. Yeah. Mm. Wow. And there's, yeah, because ultimately the question of, well, how do we, even if we know how to change, uh, success is so hard. And how do we change? Hmm. One thing that's related uh, that I'll point to here, which is not the everything, but um, but one thing is the, when we, when we have a desire to change, uh, whether it's not watching Netflix or not eating certain types of foods or what you know, whatever it is, um, the acceptance piece is relevant here. In that, uh, if we you know try to like go towards the way that we want to be and try to push away the thing that we don't want, we find ourselves kind of in that like locked in that trapped struggle once again and. There's a move here that I think is valuable and important uh, for like accepting the, I'm going to say the coherence of those conflicting wants and desires in us uh, and be able to not just say like, oh, that's a bad part of myself. I have to push it away because that just gets you in a fight with that part of yourself. Uh, but to be able to accept that like, yeah, binging Netflix feels really good and it relieves this kind of like when I've had this kind of a day and I just like it meets a real need for me uh, or you know uh, ice cream it's just like it it really like I I actually want it and accepting that like it's okay that I want it even as I, I don't want it at the same time because also like so there's some parts where I see which are even more of the psychological insight but I guess what I'm saying is have you seen I don't want to call them hacks but let me let me give you two analogies that i can think of of like maybe even just more practical so one is this finder's course uh i don't know if people have come across it this guy jeffrey martin what i found fascinating was one insight he had it was a slightly different area it was like okay if people do intense waking up practices traditionally like you do a lot of meditation or you do some other practices there's quite a risk people have like dark night of the soul stuff you know, they'll, they'll, they won't go well. In fact, it will go badly in some way, right? <laughs> they lose sense with whatever. And what he did was like, okay, I'm just going to basically build this protocol. I'm not an innovator in the sense of coming up with any new kind of practices. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to front load my, my three-month program with a whole bunch of like positive psychology type stuff. I'm going to have people do gratitude. I'm going to have them go and do generosity exercises. I'm going to have them... I don't know, do kind of meta, you know, loving kindness meditations, but I'm just going to front load this program with a bunch of positive psych, well-tested positive psychology, or I'll do journaling, whatever. And this was a highly effective in removing dark night of the soul experiences, it seemed relatively, relatively. And also actually even turned out to actually maybe kind of be good for the effectiveness of some of the other practices. And so that's kind of like more in the just almost empirical well, the other example I could think of is from Landmark. Um, I don't know if people, anyone here has done Landmark or whatever, but a very interesting aspect of them getting people to take action. So not just be like, oh yeah, I've really got this resentment against my mother, which is itself a powerful insight, but often kind of doesn't, it kind of dissipates quite fast, right? When your mother annoys you again. 
and they obviously partnered by having this large group and kind of how they they I mean I won't go into the detail, but they kind of have people take action, like calling their mother and telling their mother that they've got this kind of resentment or whatever that's been going on, which obviously is is a kind of like a kind of it's not a hack. I don't want to that sounds derogatory, but it turns this insight into something that's kind of like persists in a much bigger way. So I mm -hmm. wonder like. Have you watched in the cohorts that you've run, like how many people drop out? Why do they drop out? Like if, you know, how, what kind of people ended up sticking around to do the practices week after week versus which ones didn't? Um, are there any kind of tweaks of like how you ran things that would be like, oh, people, that was really effective, whereas that wasn't, you know? Um, that's kind of the thing I'm also wondering about, as well as the kind of like, what I heard you say was even like, you got to practice a lot of acceptance. Like that might be a really key upfront, which is why you mentioned it as one of the first practices. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, and I'm right now hearing that I'm feeling like, oh, and I wish I keep, you know, I, I hope that we can keep improving and learning, you know, our effectiveness and uh, you know, retention rates. That, and, yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I feel that desire. And I think there's, I think there's a whole lot that absolutely has to do with um, our socialness as social animals uh, and the role of culture and collective and social support. Um, I don't know exactly how Landmark does it, but if they, you know, if they have you like pull out your phone and call your mother right there, like that's a like, oh, the, you know, the, oh, even just the, the awareness and the accountability-ness of it, of like, oh, I'm here with these people and this is how I want to be. So I'm going to take motion in this supported culture and this supported collective context. So all these people are right here with me. They're cheering me on. Okay, here I go. Uh, you know, I think that's, you know, signifies something that really that, that um, the culture that we're embedded in and which is kind of like how, what culture do we, and even like what culture do we spend the most time in? Where do we spend most of our time and what are the norms and expectations of the culture in which we spend most of our time? Yes, we carry our own little micro culture around with us, uh, of course, but the embeddedness in who's around you and what is expected and what are the norms and, you know, you can, oh, much like people talk about second brain in terms of like note taking systems, you know, and extending your, you know, memory and your, your notes and all of that. Uh, I think you can extend your awareness through other people and other people can play a role in your system of awareness. And when you are with them and you come into contact with them and they don't even have to like nag you like an uh, accountability partner, quote unquote, uh, but being with them reminds you of the, the person that you're trying to be uh, and helps you support yourself in that awareness and um, support so much i think a lot of so, you know things come down to like how small our working memory is as humans it's just there's oh so few things that we can fit in our attention at any one time uh that you know surrounding ourselves with with reminders and culture that helps doing that does that for us um yeah i put a lot of stock in, in that being one of the, the main determinants of effectiveness and follow through and yeah. That's beautiful, James, thank you. Thank you so much for this really fruitful discussion and what everybody's been contributing. Um, I think there's so much more, as you mentioned, that we could unpack um and maybe we should maybe we should have a part two who knows but um for the meantime I'm just mindful we've gone slightly over time which is no problem um I just want to give anyone else the opportunity to ask any kind of final questions or share any final thoughts um if anybody does have anything feel free to unmute yourself and just jump in now or drop it in the chat and if not, then James, would you like to offer any like final parting words before we before we say goodbye and end this call? Anything you want to leave us with? Mm, parting words of gratitude <laughs> uh, and of appreciation, being with you and in contact with uh, folks, even those who didn't say anything. Uh, just seeing your expressions uh, throughout the last hour, and this is. Uh, um, has been such a wonderful uh, experience here. And thank you for helping me on my journey 
And I hope that I and and we, you know, can can carry this uh, or, you know, every other, you know, thing that we find that helps us to to grow and to live the lives that we want to live and be the people that we want to be uh, with us and be of service uh, to ourselves and to the world. So thank you all once again. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, I'm going to say goodbye and end the call. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, James. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you.